And now we have Jay Sherry. There's Jungian analysts and Jungian candidates and um, Jungian crit critiques. And there's a whole other group of Jungian scholars who bring so much to bear on our understanding of the context from which Jung emerged. And Jay Sherry has been among the most constant and present and prolific. And we're thrilled that he's here today to tell us some of the research that came from the publication of his book. Jay? Hi, good morning. First of all, I want to thank the JPA for the invitation to speak here today. Um, and we should note that today is Emma Jung's 137th birthday. So to get started, um, today I want to chart um, one strand of the process uh, with a look at the arc of his aesthetic education, a journey that began in Basel and led to the Red Book. What the hell is that? Uh, Basel was an important center of Renaissance publishing and home of Erasmus. The city's educational system had the neo humanist gold of Bildung, which in English is often translated as cultivation, which in itself is one of the origins of Jung's experiential sense of the concept of individuation. This educational system, one of the finest in Europe, was based on a philosophy that considered art training to be fundamental to the creation of true individuality. Uh, in the city school, this is a memory that Jung shares in memories, dreams, and reflections. I could only draw what stirred my imagination. My teacher set before me the picture of a goat's head. This assignment I failed completely, and that was the end of my drawing classes. But fortunately, although the classes were over, he continued to draw, as we saw uh, in his uh, juvenile notebooks uh, in Thomas's presentation. Jung was exposed to the art, to art, excuse me, at the local museum and at home where he remembered a biblical painting, um, excuse, um, and excuse me, uh, and a landscape uh, that hung in the parlor of the parsonage. So what you're seeing is not that particular painting. Uh, I'd like to find out from Thomas if they've identified uh, the painting that was in the parsonage. It did go to the family of Franz Jung, if it's still in their uh, possession. But this would be a comparable, excuse me, this would be a comparable painting of the period. Did I go off? No, I didn't, sorry. Um, and in particular, this is by, as you can see, Carl Gustav Carus. Carus was one of Jung's prime uh, predecessors in the psychology of the unconscious. Carus was German. He was a friend of Goethe and became, he went from being a rather amateur artist to a very gifted one and a friend of the most famous German romantic painter, Caspar David Friedrich. Uh, What's important about this is that he would have seen this art uh, everywhere at the museum, the Kunsthaus, and it would have been in the homes all over Swiss Germany and in Germany itself. Um, and of course, it was a long-lived tradition. Of course, a family acquired a painting like this early in the century and was, of course, prominently and proudly displayed in homes throughout that region. Um, one important element of German Romantic painting is 
the use of twilight. And here now, uh, again, similar to several that Thomas showed earlier, would be one of the pastels he did in his medical school years. It's important because twilight was both, was both a aesthetic phenomenon, but as a medical student, as a uh, pioneer psychiatrist, twilight states were already also a psychological inner phenomenon as well as an outer aesthetic phenomenon. Um, Carus himself, and I, we don't know, I'd like to find out in further research if Jung was familiar with Carus's nine essays on landscape painting. Uh, it's a very intriguing lead to follow up on. Uh, Carus was very much that Renaissance man that Jung was a later version of. A facility with art was expected by his professors at the university. With his theory of the oriflanza, the archetypal plant, Goethe had championed a mode of cognition called Anschauung, or seeing into. We might say in English, insight. This transcends sense perceptions to include one's inner vision. To quote Jung again from uh, Memory's Dreams, from his university years as he prepared to take his examinations, he was expected to uh, do some slide identifications and he took a shortcut by saying the following, quote, I had imagination enough to picture the demonstrated procedures. And certainly, it's well established that Goethe's morphology of the Orflanza was a critical uh, component of Jung's later uh, concept of the archetypes. And of course, the transition figure here is the famous Basel art historian, uh, Jacob Burkhardt. And of course, Jung in uh, what we now call symbols of transformation refers to Burkhardt's um, motifs of the ore build and the folk motifs about literature, art, and folklore. So he's at the university, he's at the and of course, you just go, wow, the time to go to school, the needs, you know, always one stands in awe. Well, Solomon, this was from von Stuck, the most famous young steel artist of Munich. And you know, what we need to know and understand and remember was a member of the Nietzsche generation, the Nietzsche generation of the 1890s. This generation were young, neo romantic visionaries pushing back against the growing dominance of positive, positivism in science, impressionism in art, and naturalism in literature. The appeal of the symbolism was widespread, and it was very much in that cohort. They all read, debated, discussed, and tried to live out in each case the famous the birth of tragedy. Of all the figures there, the one that stands out for this generation was the rebirth of Dionysus. Bullying impulses are repressed by Christianity, but now being reactivated. Enthusiasm and theos. To quote a New York critic of the day, quote, the pagan spirit is the red blood of our dream. Always somewhere in the world, 
there is birth a human remnant of the great God Pan. Over all reigns Aphrodite. Here we go. The thing T.H. Lawrence. This was the time that the dance of the seven veils was inspiring the women who were creating modern dance like a Michael Miller, Isadora Duncan, and Ruth Sandy. And we might have of course, in a, a <coughs> echelon of culture this inspired the first strip teasers all over America. So, this is shown as a transition from the more traditional romantic, the first generation, to the more neo-romantic, more blown out, symbolic, material, erotic. And all of this is going on when he, of course, is the founding figure and the crown of so psychoanalysis. But that long and studied, troubled relationship came to an end in over New Year's of 1913. And tracking, uh, doing timelines about Noam's artwork, it's not a surprise to see that much of his activity was clustered over the holidays. He was off from his practice, some of the other demands of everyday life, and he could do it himself to a kind of wonderful experience of his art. Often through the, uh, uh, both the Christmas, New Year's holiday, and over things. So here's Jung, he breaks with Freud over New Year's, and what's very, very important is he comes to New York in March of 1913. And this was some of my research for many, many, many years. Uh, it's important because in March, he's chaperoned around New York by his leading American promoter, Beatrice. That's important because this visit was a downtown British village experience, quite unlike his previous visit to New York for the forum lectures, which were very much uptown and professional. So it's a whole switch. He's, his world is turned upside down emotionally with his brain. As we know, he's in a famous area, he knows the confrontation with the unconscious. But it was not just an inner journey. Of course, it's the interface of the inner and outer. So he was in New York, invited by Hinkle to come to New York to speak to a very important club of the day called the Liberal Club. And he spoke on dreams. And this is very important because the master narrative, which is usually written by the winners, says that, oh, a. a. Brill was psychoanalysis of the British village. In fact, it was not A. a. Brill who was teaching no. These people, these Bohemians, these progressives, heard Jung speak about dreams. And so that jumps started in many of their own personal experiences. But besides speaking to the liberal club, he got around. He was also invited to a dinner party hosted by America's first feminist organization, the Heterodoxy Club. And this was quite an honor because men had been invited by his lovers and others. So um, here he is, New York, so today from the talk of the Liberal Club to the Heterodoxy Club. But what's going to be important is his pivotal experience was going to the Army Show. And I want to thank Thomas Fisher for some of the references of a letter of Lincoln's prayer in 1955 or so does you know, quite clearly state that from him that he did attend the show. All the circumstantial evidence was certainly there that he had attended. 
Um, and it's very famous doing research on the Armour Show, which had a centennial several years ago. Um, Duchamp was deliberately placed in the back of the auditorium, so all the visitors had to work their way through all the other stuff to get to the famous Chamber of Horrors, as it was dubbed, far in the back of the auditorium. Uh, and people just made streamlines, uh, beelines for that back Chamber of Horrors. And New Yorkers had a field day with uh, Duchamp's New Descending. Uh, the New York Times critic likened it to an explosion in a shingle factory. And a cartoonist had great fun drawing this as uh, the subway, the subway in rush hour. So, and I think we can all relate to that one. So, um, and in the 1925 seminar, Jung writes about it. I think Thomas's quote was a variation. This is, I think, the first one I came across. Uh, a variation by Thomas in a quote. And this is what says to his first English language seminar. Um, quote, this picture presents a double dissolution of the object. That is in time and space. For not only have the figure and the stairs gone over into the triangles and squares, but the figure is up and down the stairs at the same time. And it is only by moving the picture that one can get the figure to come out as it would in an ordinary painting. So what Duchamp has done here is reduce the human figure to forms in motion. Modern art was now demanding that viewers change their perception of art from passive detachment to active participation in what they were seeing. With the notoriety and the fame of Duchamp's picture, what people don't remember is that the biggest seller was the work of the French symbolist Redon. He sold 13 paintings and pastels and sold 20 prints as well. By far, he went home with some cash. Jung's purchase of Redon's com complete graphic works published in 1913, which he probably bought upon, he ordered it upon his return to Zurich, I surmise. It clearly shows his preference for symbolism, that is, lunar imagination, synthesis over cubism, if you will, solar intellect and analysis. This show was the pivotal event in Jung's return to making art and took it in a radically new direction. The visual stimulation was supplemented with reading Waringer's abstraction and empathy with its distinction between two fundamental artistic impulses, one oriented to the sensuous and the other to the abstract. He gave these as supporting evidence for his new theory of extroversion and introversion in the paper he gave later that year at the last psychoanalytic congress he was to attend. He was also introduced to the works of William Blake. I think it's very likely that this was by Gibran, who had done his portrait to Shaw a little earlier. 
And by the way, that portrait was done uh, in Chevron Studio, which is just a few blocks uh, west of here on 10th Street. It was called the Studio Building. And it was the first home for artists in New York with large studios, skylights, that of course supported their artistic work. So uh, the Heterodoxy Party was a block away on Patchen Place, and so one can see Jung really circulating here in Greenwich Village. Uh, Beatrice Hinkle lived on Gramercy Park, but they were a hop, skip, and a taxi ride away from their circle, her circle, that she introduced him to here in Greenwich Village. Um, so, Blake, and the, the catalog of the, the library of C.G. Jung shows that he owned a copy of the 1913 Blake calendar. So I'm guessing that, of course, it's March, and calendars are on sale by March. <laughs> so maybe as he walked past one of the local bookstores, you know, maybe, maybe it's all surmise and speculation, but I think very, very possible. You know, he stopped in, picked up a Blake calendar, maybe that was already marked down. The strand wasn't open yet, but a forerunner of the strand, perhaps. So, uh, and just to contextualize some of this, one could go on and on with images, as we know, the imagination and the riot. But important at this time, too, was Kandinsky's famous manifesto, The Spiritual in Modern Art. This was on everybody's lips. It was passed from hand to hand, and certainly the inspiration for this whole generation of the first modern artists. Uh, and there'll be talk a little later about music and color. This is just a reference point to a whole uh, synthesis of, I'm sure, today's topics and themes. Um, so I won't go into too much of that, but already we're seeing <clears throat> uh, Jung's engagement, if not directly with Kandinsky. This would have been in the, the milieu. Certainly, if you didn't read the book, he was engaged in conversations with those who were. So, what I'd like to do now is move to several things from the Red Book. And where does one begin to sort it all out? But what I'd like to focus on and slow down here uh, is to let you all just take this in for a few minutes. You're familiar with it, but let's share it together. I have some things to say, and of course, um, let's all revisit it. Uh, Thomas showed what would be the adjacent uh, section of this. Of course, this is the main capital. And if you're wondering why there are so many D's in the Red Book, it's of course, Dare, D, or Das. <laughs> so, I, okay, so the D. So, uh, the first slide, and let's just look at the zones. Jung often organized pictures in zones. This was the opening capital. Let's start with the middle zone. Of course, many number of the images in the Red Book show water, the medieval town, which certainly harkens back to his boyhood years in Basel. He watched the river boats go up and down from his home in Klein Hunningen. Klein Hunningen was the harbor of Basel, so this was very much Jung's boyhood milieu. So, the familiar zone, of course, Swiss Alps, the, the mountains so frequent in his work. And let's go up first. Of course, from the terrestrial to the, the airy to the celestial, of course, across the top, we have various zodiac planetary references. But let's follow the Kundalini serpent from the 
fiery pot to its crown. Certainly Jung's voracious appetite, his encyclopedic knowledge of world symbol systems was just bubbling over. But let's go down to the marine environment. So from the celestial to the marine. And I'm just going to advance it. Uh, so here we have Ernst Haeckel's famous art book, which was familiar to students of science as well as art, art forms in nature. I think some years back it was established or suggested strongly that one of Jung's defining dreams of those years, the radial, radiolarium dream, was very possibly seeded by his visual familiarity with Haeckel's art forms in nature. So, yeah, one more. So, thank you. So, thank you. So, let's, so we had, uh, just here with, well, directing you to the lower zone. Okay. And just inviting the coral, the, the bright red orange coral, certainly in part with the marine, of course, about four or five Portuguese men of war, lobsters, fish, uh, a shark with his teeth there about to approach us. But what's interesting for me is what he indicates at the very, very bottom is below the marine world is the molten magma. So, of course, geologically it's not that close, but just in his imagination what he wanted to convey was this raw volcanic energy, both there in the geological realm, but also here in the spiritual realm. I would suggest, of course, the parallelism of the fiery pot and the fiery magma. So, but we can see these opening capitals as I would suggest initial dreams. So often, you know, the significance of initial dreams. Well, here is Jung, his initial capital is a bold statement of some of his artistic sensibilities and intentions. Primarily, you see, like almost overloaded with some Art Nouveau, with Kundalini Yoga, certainly familiar with many of the people who he was affiliated with, and of course the various astrological symbols. But what needs to be explored is he goes from Liber Primus to Liber Secundus. Now there were some textual reasons. You can remember the very crabbed uh, Gothic writing of the first book and then it opens up in the second book. Of course a whole variety of calligraphy which needs to be explored in much, much more detail. But so opening capital almost like a dream. There's Haeckel, and now the opening capital of Liber Secundus. And I'll let your imaginations guide you to the, radically sh the radical shift in what his intentions were artistically. The Kundalini serpent has been stripped down to its, the caduceus. The, at this time, Jung was playing with color symbolism, blue for thinking, to be very blunt and direct, but he was grappling with this uh, aesthetically, blue associated with thinking function, red with feeling function. But, but certainly the stripped down form, and as I I always think Jung is still, he's doing something different, but he still wants to draw us back to what he'd already done. And I've fantasized that 
you could almost see, and correct me if I'm wrong, almost like the seven chakras, of course, this is a, a closed energy generating system, alternating energies, alternating currents. But, you know, there are seven chakras, I almost can imagine, as you kind of climb the totem pole of the dyad and the caduceus, if you will. But also, let's look at how he treats the water. Now it's strictly schematic. It's, it's sort of gone up. <laughs> you know, of course, a band of blue sky, a very simple, of course, we all can draw that kind of water scene, but that's not important. What, in a little band of green, the terrestrial world to the right, upper right corner. But here is Jung with his interest in, in strata, geological strata, one of the most famous metaphors for the levels of consciousness. But what we have here front and center is the visionary eye. I would suggest as Jung has gotten more and more involved in his deep engagement with active imaginations, certainly with various aesthetic readings and experiences, seeding his psyche. But of course, he's creating an original work always. But there is that, the inner eye. It's no longer the eye turned to that uh, romantic German landscape, but to his own inner material. And I haven't gotten very far with this, but putting that eye right there and look at the impact it has on the geology, it gets into that fragmentation that we've talked about as far as like modern art. Do you get fragmented? Do you get fractured? And certainly he realizes with that penetrating eye that there will be fracturing. Of course, the various geological strata have folded and we know all that from our geology textbooks. You know, he would have seen those textbooks. We all, he and we are all familiar with that. But he does another level to it, the fracturing that sometimes comes with the inner eye. But again, this idea of a synthesis. So it's, um, here it is, the 1920s. Certainly this is not a linear story. He goes in and out of abstraction. He goes in and out of representation. So in no way, he's of course going in all sorts of directions. It's not a linear trip. Uh, and to close with one final slide, is Juan Miro's The Tilled Field, also from the 1920s. And I'll let you take it all in, visit some of the symbols and images. So, of course, what this is not, my intention is not to say he saw Juan Miro and, you know, was inspired. But it's that collective, of course, the famous, uh, Zeitgeist, which is of course debated, but still valid term in our field. This was the Zeitgeist, the Surrealists, as we now know more and more. He was certainly aware of their writing, their activities. Again, not directly Juan Moreau, perhaps, but certainly it was that collective exposure to where art was going. Moreau was a Catalan, this is one of his many depictions of his family farm at Montreux, up in the mountains uh, west of Barcelona. And it sort of tracks his progression as an artist. He went to Paris in 1920 and became the darling of the surrealist. He was the new kid in town and widely embraced as the most poetic of the Surrealists. And, you know, we could spend hours and hours, uh, and all I'd like to point out is, of course, the tree on the right, of course, trees, landscapes, but what a new way in a visionary modality to consider landscape. And if you follow that tree to the right up to the top into the foliage, what do you see? There's that eye, <laughs> the visionary eye that permeates the anima mundi. 
in the foliage. Um, I know this is all too brief, but I hope that some of these slides have you know, deepened uh, and illustrated some of Jung's engagement with the art of his time. Thank you. I guess, of course, a few minutes for questions. Yes, Sylvester, please. Do you know whether in Jung's library there's a copy of Spiritual in Art? Yeah, I have. The book catalog was published in 1967. It's one of the most valuable things to have as far as scholarship regarding uh, Kandinsky is not in there. So I hope I try to say that. There's not a copy, and so not to make that case, but again, the milieu. You know, just, I... But do you know whether you saw the, the abstract spiritual art at that time, like, you know, Kandinsky? Well, he was in Munich. There are references. He was, and I've pointed this out to Thomas, there are references, of course, prior to 1913, where he talks about going to Munich and gorging himself on art was one of his quotes. And, but my surmise is that prior to the Tarmory show, as he went to Germany, and this is just my surmise, so much more needs to be documented, that probably he was going to some of the more traditional galleries. You know, so a suggestion is sort of he gets engaged, if you will, with the avant-garde after the Armory show. You know, it might have been there, certainly, but given his career, you know, my gosh. And, but once he breaks free of Freud, he's at the Armory show, he now wants to create, just as uh, Moreau wanted to create a poetic art, Jung wanted to create a poetic science. And so there was an openness to some of what was implied. And we now know more and more that in art history, this whole spiritual dimension was pushed to the side. It was the underground tradition in modern art. And it's been around, you know, since the 80s. There was a very famous show at the Guggenheim, The Spiritual in Modern Art, uh, a critical turning point for appreciating. And right now at the Guggenheim is Hilma of Klint, who I know, uh, Beverly was suggesting people if they have time to see it because there are so many overlaps. You know, this idea of the spiritual, be it Kandinsky or not, people were deeply, deeply, deeply engaged with this material. You know, both uh, from their own inner dreams, but also from their reading. All of the mystics were being discovered again. Blake was, in 1912, the Blake Society was founded. There was a whole, because of Ray Dawn and the symbolists, there was a return to appreciating symbolism. And of course, the master narrative of modernism, you know, it's sort of the loser, you know, if you will. But the underground stream is there always to come back up. I hope that helps a little bit. Thanks, Sylvester. Any other questions? Yes, please. I think it's a very interesting question just to play with it a little bit. Um, 
know, this was the moment where he was, along with so much else theoretically, was rejecting the Freudian mode of analysis. You know, of course, you know, the, there was a couch in his uh, uh, room, but of course, sitting up face to face, all the things we associate with, you know, so what kind of makes Jungian analysis and therapy a little different. The face to face, he showed the Red Book. That's one of the famous things about the Red Book. Although he was not an artist in the sense of public distribution, commodification, he was an art maker. And he wasn't shy to share the work with family and friends and, and Alice Hands. You know, in people's memories or memoirs, they'll say, you know, a second session and Jung pulled out the Red Book. <laughs> you know, wow, you know. So he was very engaged, not just to show off his art, but to, pre to uh, present a template for them to do the same. Because one of the lost chapters of Jung analysis was how everybody was doing active imagination. Not just Christiana Morgan. Lots and lots and lots of folks, you know, it's there in the, you know, the memoirs, the letters, the diaries. You know, so many were doing it, because that was the invitation. You know, follow my lead, follow your lead, of course, too, if that helps you a little bit. Thank you. If not, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. In some of his later writings, um, Jung speaks about how it's only in art and art imagery that creation and destruction come together and spirit and emotion come together. And I think you see that in what's, what you've introduced us to, Jay. And also, just to bring it a bit up to date, both Bill Viola, the American video artist, and Anselm Kiefer, the German artist, very consciously quote Jung and exemplify this notion of spirit and emotion, creation and destruction, showing together in, in works of art and images. So I just wanted to bring it sort of into the moment.